Amen. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. How many ever watched the game show Jeopardy? Right? I love that show too. Jeopardy. The interesting thing about Jeopardy, though, is that it is filled with people that make me feel dumb. Like, if I get an answer right, I'm like, yeah! And I got like one out of 50. Very intelligent people. Some of the uh, smartest people go on that show and they compete and they win, etc., etc. But one thing that people don't often think about when they watch this show is the buzzer. Now, obviously, our teen Bible quiz, those kids think about the buzzer because they've realized that that buzzer is just as important as knowing the correct answer. And oftentimes, when you're watching this show, you don't realize that most of the time, these are very intelligent people. All three of them know the answer. The difference is who gets in on the buzzer in time. That's really the key difference there. You may not realize this, but they actually are not allowed to push that button until the question, the actual rule says that once the last syllable of the question has been pronounced, a half a second later, the buzzers are activated and they can hit it. Up until that point, the buzzers don't work. They don't do anything. I didn't know that. The person reading the question actually has to be allowed to finish the question before they can answer. You cannot interrupt and interject in the middle of the question. Now, it didn't always used to be that way. And so the result was that he would start to read the question and they would all just jump in because they were trying to get in first and they would just throw out guesses and often wrong answers and then the people watching the show didn't even know what the question was so it was not good from an entertainment perspective so they changed the rule to where you are not allowed to interrupt the guy asking the question you know in the real world the reality is there is nobody locking out our buzzers and we can interrupt, we can interject, we can open our mouths and we can say things we probably shouldn't say and we do all the time. Do you know that the Bible actually gives us a tremendous amount of instruction on how we should interact with each other? And this particular issue is addressed in the Word of God. And we want to look at it this morning. Let's look at Proverbs 18, starting in verse 12. This is Solomon. And Solomon says, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty or prideful, but humility goes before honor. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? So let's break this down. Let's look, first of all, at pride versus humility. So the book of Proverbs is an interesting book in that, you know, we have different books in the Bible. Some are historic, some are very narrative, uh, some are letters, some are poetry, etc., etc. The book of Proverbs is a lot of just little quips of wisdom. And sometimes they flow together, sometimes they're very disjointed and they don't go together. Uh, but the interesting thing is that I think these verses do follow the same train of thought. However, I lost my place there. But what we are dealing with here in these particular uh, uh, verses here, I think is a, is, a, is a very specific type of person. And how that person responds to us and how we respond to them. So let's break these three verses down. Looking at verse 12, Solomon says, Before destruction, the heart of a man is prideful, but humility goes before honor. Again, Solomon is describing a very specific person here. This is a person with an arrogant spirit. This is a person who is rude, who is unwilling to be instructed. This is a person who believes they have all of the answers in life and they don't want to listen to anyone else. This is a person whose behavior suggests they have a very high opinion of themselves. They believe they are better 
They believe they are smarter. They believe they are more interesting, uh, more affluent. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Now, the flip side of that, and I think the reality of it, is not necessarily just that they think of themselves higher than others, but they look at others and think lowly of them. That may seem like the same thing, but think about it for a moment. They look at other people and they look at them as if they are not as valuable as others. They think lowly of other people. James 2, 8 and 9, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing well. But if you show partiality or favoritism, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Every single one of us is created in the image of God. Is that not what the Bible says? That none are more valuable than others in the eyes of God. We are all children of God. We are all loved by God. We are all cherished by God. People have told us all our lives, you are special to God. And that's a true statement. However, none of us are more special to God than others. How many know that Jesus died for every single one of us? He loved each and every one of us that same amount that he would have died for all of us and did. Whatever gifts or blessings we may have, who do they come from? They come from God. And the reality is they can be taken away. Galatians 2.6, Paul says, but from those who were of high reputation, and then he says, what they may or what they were makes no difference to me, for God shows no partiality. Interesting statement that Paul makes. Paul is dealing with these people and he says, you know, these are the politicians, the authority leaders. These are all these people of high reputation. And Paul looks at that situation and says, but I don't care who they are. Because in the eyes of God, we are all sinners. We are all in need of the blood of Christ and we must all repent. We are all equal on that plane. So let's look secondly at speaking versus listening. So verse 13 of our text Solomon gives us a warning about speaking before listening. And he says, he who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. The reality is, though, this is something we all do from time to time. I'm guilty, you are guilty, either out of ignorance, out of impatience or excitement. That's where I fall into it. I get excited about something and I, I want to, you know, on Bible study on Wednesday night, my wife tells me all the time to shut up and let other people talk. But the problem is somebody will say something and then all of a sudden it just starts triggering. Oh, and that connects here and the Bible says this and this and this and this and I get the shut up, let people talk. But those instances are not really the point of what Solomon's making here, that Solomon's making. What Solomon is warning about is something far more malicious. This is a person who has a wrong spirit, that is, has a prideful heart. It is a person who lacks concern or care in regards to other people. When this is happening with someone we have a relationship with, it can be very disheartening, can it? When this is someone who has a measure of authority over our lives, whether it's a parent, a spouse, or a boss, or whoever it is, it can be very disheartening. How many of you have ever worked for someone and you try to go and talk to them and they will not listen? And because they have authority over your life, it can be miserable and disheartening. Why will they not listen? Why will they not understand where I'm coming from or what is happening here? 
Their unwillingness to listen, their unwillingness to understand our point of view can have a tremendous effect on us. From time to time, we have all dealt with the person that Solomon is describing here. They've already made up their mind before the discussion ever begins. They've already decided that you're wrong before you've ever opened your mouth. They're not actually listening when you're speaking to them. They're talk, you're talking and you can see it in their eyes. They're not listening. They're formulating their next response. You know what I'm talking about? We've all been on the receiving end of that. However, if we're being honest with ourselves, most of us have also been that person from time to time. We've already made up our mind. We're right, they're wrong. We're not going to listen to anything they have to say. We've already shut them down. An old pastor of mine, he used to say, when disciples stop asking questions and start making statements, discipleship is over. And what he was saying with that is that they are no longer listening. They are no longer learning. They are no longer desiring wisdom. In their mind, they have reached the pinnacle now where instead of desiring and acquiring wisdom and learning and growing, they believe they've reached the pinnacle where they are now dispelling wisdom on everyone. They believe they've learned all they can. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, you cannot fill a cup that is already full. In other words, anything you attempt to put in it is just simply going to spill out and they will not retain anything. How many know that in our lives, we are never to stop receiving and hearing and learning and growing and being discipled and growing closer to God and more like Christ? As long as we are on this earth, we have never and never will reach that point of full sanctification. The reality is when we treat other people this way, what we're saying is that we don't value them. What they have to say doesn't matter. It doesn't concern me. It's not important. We've all heard the expression, facts, not feelings. Everyone's heard that expression? We see that a lot today for some very specific reasons. And the sentiment behind it is, it doesn't matter how you feel about something, because it doesn't change the facts, right? Truth is still truth, whether we want it to be or not. Yes, but I just feel that, well, it doesn't matter, right? The earth is round whether we feel that it's flat or not. Facts are facts. And I think most of us would agree with that statement. However, there is a danger where we shift so far over to this side, where we start to engage people as if their feelings don't matter at all. But they do. We are created in the image of God. We are emotional creatures. Without them, we are nothing more than machines following a prescribed pattern of life. Without our emotions, without our feelings, we would lack joy, happiness, fear, anger, love. These things make us who we are. They make us unique. They make us human. And to completely discard them and throw them off, to have no compassion, love, and mercy for others, that's not who we are. Now, we don't live by our emotions. If we lived by our emotions, our life would be a disaster. But to completely discard them as not being important is just not biblical. We have to remember that the power we exert over others with these emotions is, can be extreme. How many know you cannot underestimate the power of your words to crush someone? to lift them up, to let them know that you care, that you hear them, you understand what they're going through. 
Proverbs 17, verse 27, he who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. When a wicked man comes, contempt also comes, and with dishonor comes scorn. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters, and the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. The person who says to us, well, I just say it like it is. The person who says, well, if they don't like the truth, that's their problem. How many of you ever encountered that person? Well, I'm just going to speak truth. I don't know if you can make that phrase without shaking your neck. Well, I'm just going to speak truth. I just realized that. By and large, this is the person Solomon's talking about. They are rude. They are self-centered. They lack mercy. They are able to recognize everyone else's flaws, but they cannot recognize their own. How many many know that sometimes the wisest and smartest thing that we can say is nothing? Nothing. Not everything that comes into our mind needs to be spoken. Just because you're right doesn't make it right. You know, we depend upon each other for comfort, for support, and even validation. How many know that that we need to be validated by one another? That we need to know that we are loved and cared about by one another? Our children need to know that. Our spouses need to know that. James 1, 19 says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. As John Wayne once famously said, You're long on mouth and short on ear. Let's look lastly at the spirit versus the flesh. So this verse 14 of this text is the the, the part of the text that I think is the most interesting. And you might read it and think that it's, it's very disconnected from the other two verses, but I don't think that it is. I think there is a similar train of thought and a connection here. First, In verse 12, Solomon mentions this person who is prideful. They lack humility. And then in verse 13, he mentions this person who will not listen. They lack wisdom. They lack a love for people. And then we get into verse 14, and he makes this statement. He says, the spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? Let's read that one more time. The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? Does that sound familiar? I think that we've all grown up hearing something very, very familiar to that statement. It goes like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names can never hurt me. Those two statements are extremely similar, except they are counter-opposed. The rhyme that we grew up listening to all of our life says to us, physical harm is what we should be weary of. That we should be cautious about the sticks and stones that may break our bones, but that words will not hurt us. They will not damage us. They're not that big of a deal. But the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, says the exact opposite. He says that sickness and pain and physical injury are extremely limited in what they can do and that as a person we can bear those things. But then he goes on and he say and he says but a broken spirit will crush us. When 
when our spirit is broken, when our heart is crushed, Solomon says the damage is far more severe than any physical damage that can come. Its effects are deeper. They are longer lasting. They cut in. How many know that scars heal? But they leave pretty deep wounds. Proverbs 15, 13, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. Solomon also says a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Solomon is describing a person who is filled with despair. They are filled with dread. They are filled with depression. We always like to, you know, in, in, in Christian circles, we like to cast out this idea of depression. Well, if you're depressed, you just need to get the joy of the Lord and pray that out and then just, woo! That's not what Solomon says. That's not the reality that we live in. All throughout the Bible, there are men who suffered from depression and emotional struggles. This is the reality of humanity. Their spirit is crushed. Their spirit has been shaken. They are defeated. They have lost all hope. You and I should take care not to wound the spirit of another person. Parents, this is especially important when it comes to our children. That we should not crush their spirit. Paul says in Colossians, fathers, do not exacerbate your children so that they will not lose heart. Paul says, don't embitter them. Don't nag them. Don't pick apart everything they do. Don't destroy them by every failure that they have. I mean, you know, spouses, you should not nag your husband constantly. Wait, that was too specific. Spouses, you shouldn't nag your other spouse. The Bible says it is better to live on the corner of the housetop than with a nagging wife. We must correct our children, yes. We must discipline our children, yes. But the focus must always be on their behavior, not who they are as a person. How many know that people don't need a constant reminder of their failures? One of my favorite songs uh, by Jackson Brown, he makes a statement in it, and I've said it before. He says, don't confront me with my failures, for I have not forgotten them. Rather, we need forgiveness, we need grace, we need room to grow and to move forward. We need people who will listen and care about what we say. How many know that we need people in our lives that that we're important to them, we matter to them? The world may not care about us, but I know they care. I know that they love me. I know that they're in my corner, that they support me. We need that. I want to close this morning. The pulpit commentary makes an interesting statement in regards to this verse. And he says, the body can, as it were, fall back upon the support of the spirit when it is distressed and weakened. But when the spirit itself is broken, grieved, wearied, debilitated, it has no resource, no higher faculty to which it can appeal. And it must succumb beneath the pressure. Now, I would argue, however, that there are, in fact, a couple of resources that we have and that we can appeal to. And the first one is people who love and care about us. If you've been married long enough, you know you can always go to your spouse and they will be there for you. No matter how 
difficult or strained the relationship may be at the time, no matter how much you've been fighting and arguing and want to put your finger right in their nose, and all of a sudden something comes into your life and you are crushed and you still know you can go to them and they will be there for you. Even when we are a hundred percent in the wrong, you can go to them and they will be there for you and they will support you and lift you up. There are certain people in our lives that we can go to and we know they're going to be there for us. We know they're not going to judge us. I look at Job. And the best friends he had showed up and centered around him. And did they support him and lift him up? No. What did they do? Well, you're just living in sin, bro. You just need to get your heart right. And I think to myself, Job, you need better friends, man. And Job wasn't even in the wrong. I could be completely in the wrong and I still know that I have friends that I can go to and man, they will help me, they will comfort me, they will lift me up. They're not going to lie to me and tell me that I'm in the right. Of course not. But they're also not going to crush me and destroy me. They're people that we can appeal to. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Paul says in Romans 1.12, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. And obviously the second entity that we can appeal to is God. It doesn't matter how wrong we are, how horrible we've been. It doesn't matter what we have done in life. We can always go to God and God will lift us up and comfort us and help us and be there for us. Yes, there may be conviction. Yes, there may be correction. God is not going to tell us that our sin is okay. Of course not. But his love and his grace and his mercy is and will always be there for us. And he will lift us up and comfort us because he loves us. God's desire is never to crush us. God's desire is to direct us and guide us. Yes, he will let us fall. But his purpose is always to lift us up and make us better. I mean, you know, there have been many times in all of our lives when God has had to say, okay, I'm going to let you fall. But when we fall, he is there. He never abandons us. His purpose is to purge sin from our lives, to purge unrighteousness from our lives, to draw us closer to him. And I would say to each and every one of us, How many people do you have in your life that you can go to? On the flip side of that, how many people are in your life that they know they can come to you in their darkest hour? Can they come to you and it's not going to be repeated? It's not going to be gossiped about? That they're going to be supported and loved and not rebuked? We need to be that person for other people. We need to be that type of father, that type of mother, husband, wife. We need to have compassion for other people. I very, very strongly am an advocate for the idea of of feelings do not change what truth is. But I also don't want to go so far in that other regard that I disregard that feelings don't matter because they do matter. I often find it very difficult when my wife comes home and she wants to talk. And I don't want to talk. I am mentally exhausted. And I'm listening and I'm listening and and all my brain says is she's still saying more words. But I need to be there for her. I need to listen. We need to be that type of husband, father, spouse, parent. We need to be that for our family. We need to be that for our church family, for our friends, our loved ones. 
We need to have compassion and we need to see people and value people the way that God sees and values them. Would you, would you uh, bow your heads with me this morning? Aren't you grateful for the compassion, the grace, and the mercy that God has for you and I? And the question becomes, do we have that for other people? Or are we prideful? Are we arrogant? Are we haughty in our spirit? Do we not listen? Do we already assume we know what they're going to say and that they're wrong and that we're right? Sometimes even when people are wrong, they still need someone who will just listen and have compassion. Maybe you don't have anyone else like that in your life. Well, I'll tell you, there is one person that wants to be in your life that does, and that's God, that's Christ. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Christ, but you want to change that this morning. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If that's you, I want to ask you if you would just lift up your hand and acknowledge this morning that I want to give my life to Christ. I want to have a relationship with him. I see that hand. You can put it down.